Get your rag, get your rag. Underground newspaper. Good for your mind. There was just a sense, a, palp a palpable sense of history, a sense that something very important was happening. You could feel it. Everything was a little bit larger than life. I mean, democracy wasn't about electing people to office and then, you know, waiting around and hoping they did something that you liked. It was about taking direct action. And part of the whole ethic, as you may know, is that we not only wrote about the news, but we were making the news. So we would organize a demonstration, we would be at the demonstration, then we'd come back and write about the demonstration. I mean, I mean we, we, felt, we felt compelled to, to promote social, political responsibility and, and to stand up to things that we saw as being unjust. I mean, there was anger and frustration and, and more outrage, but it was based on this idealism that came from a purity of heart, I really think. It was, wow, something's happening here, and I want to find out what it is. I think it was really important because it was the beginning of alternative press. The RAG was an underground newspaper based in Austin, Texas, that published from 1966 to 1977. Staffed by volunteer labor, it offered a voice to a growing movement that demanded social and political change. I think the beginning really had a lot to do with the politics of Students for a Democratic Society and the, the concept, uh, the overriding concept of, of SDS was participatory democracy. 1966 was a year of political and cultural rebellion. Protests against the Vietnam War raged on college campuses. Demands for civil rights for minorities, for women, for students were constant and unyielding. A counterculture was being created by young men and women. These issues that were important to the movement were not being covered by the local media. The Daily Texan was a student newspaper of the University of Texas. For the Daily Texan, at that time, the editor of the Daily Texan was uh, very right-wing, very outspokenly right-wing, and there were simply, there were simply, you couldn't even write a letter to the Texan and expect it to get published that questioned the war. The rag was pretty much the logical next step. Uh, to be taken. There were already some, a few underground newspapers that had started around the country. The thing is that most of they were either very political or very countercultural. Austin, of course, was a, had a you know emerging community of, of uh, a pretty substantial left and and hip community. The rag was, you know, was always tied to the political arena, but it also had its own. Dynamic, so the sex, drug, rock and roll. There was a, a lot of stuff going in the rag that I didn't understand. But I was very aware by that time that, that the what we call later the straight media were not giving us straight skinny. And therefore the underground press, it seemed to me, was necessary and we had to protect it no matter what it was printing. One of the wonderful things about the rag in the early days, especially and I think onwards always, was that it had room for everything. Yeah. Um, we had a motorcycle column, you know, we had <laughs> movie reviews, we had artists who would sit in the corner on God knows what drug <laughs> tiny little things for hours all the way through the night and whatever people wanted to contribute that really came from their creativity and their vision of something different 
was we tried to find a space for it. The rag was really this one of the few, probably the only, maybe the only at that point, that had attempted this synthesis of the political and the cultural. Gentle Thursday really, really reflected something about the rag that was unique. There was a whole day where people were just going to be gentle. You know, we're going to be kind to each other. We're going to be considerate and loving. Uh, that was in the very early days of the rag, and we started out with this little. You know, a little one column inch ad saying, Gentle Thursday is coming. What's that? So every week it would get a little bigger and a little, until it was a full page ad. And then we were, posters were all over campus. And Gentle Thursday was a, you know, we just, it was, well, you know, bring your balloons, <laughs> you know, bring your noisemakers, bring your kids, bring your dogs to in the, go on to campus. Well, I go walking on a sunny day, pick some flowers along the To just sit in public and have fun in a different kind of way than drinking beer and going to football games and getting rowdy was, to me, the best thing we could possibly do and the most welcoming thing we could do here also. You know, it's like we're here, we have balloons, we're playing music, we're having a good time, you're perfectly welcome to join us, you know. You know, and how bizarre that that should be seen as a radical notion. Well, of course, such a, you know, a subversive uh, kind of enterprise freaked out the, the administration, and General Thursday was banned from campus. And this is just an interesting way how things get politicized. Suddenly, to participate in General Thursday was not only a, it was not only a love-in, but it was also a political act. Gentle Thursday captured the spirit of the times. It became a happening an event that represented everything that young people supported, and it quickly was adopted in college campuses throughout the country. Gentle Thursdays filtered into high schools and was even celebrated in Europe. It is amazing to me to think back at, the, at this tiny little comic book sized newspaper and the uproar that uh, it created. We were definitely advocacy journalism. We, there, was no, there was no pretense uh, to traditional objectivity. Uh, it was obviously an involved kind of journalism, uh, but the difference was that our, we didn't hide where we were coming from. If you look at the early issues of the RAG, they covered civil rights, uh, they covered SNCC, they covered the emerging Black Panther Party, they covered um, local civil rights. The RAG staff was involved in a number of the demonstrations and calls for equal rights. There was a demonstration at this gas station in Austin, um, Don, owned by Don Whedon, yeah? and he was refusing to sell gas to people with long hair and to black people, and something had happened, some particular incident with a black guy had happened, and we had this protest and then sit down. We blocked his driveway and we got arrested, all of us, about 60 of us maybe. And on that day we were doing a sort of civil disobedience thing and I remember this big cop coming and hoisting me up on his own from behind so he had my arms up like this and he was pushing me towards the paddy wagon rather than dragging me. And I remember like being out like this and sort of digging my heels in to make it a little more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody got a picture of it from the side, you know, with this cop holding me up with my feet out. And the caption in the rag was, and they shall turn their swords into plowshares. <laughs> I, I haven't picked up and I haven't seen that picture, but if there's a picture, that's the one that for me most captured the spirit of, of the kind of humor and, and passion of the thing. 
Freedom of speech concerns led to a constant state of conflict between the RAG and the University of Texas administration. Frank Irwin ran the University of Texas. It was a, it was a, his domain, and he didn't want any embarrassment to the university or to the president of the United States or whatever. And I think he took personal offense that this newspaper even existed. By issue five, where we're already reporting on George Vizard getting busted selling the rag. So, I mean, it was like constant animosity from the administration. Also in the spring of 67, there was uh, the University Freedom Movement on campus, which started because uh, Vice President Humphrey was coming to talk to the legislature. And there was going to be a, a demonstration, and a meeting was held on the West Campus to plan for that, on the West Mall to plan for that. But the meeting to plan for it hadn't been approved. So uh, a number of students uh, were all suspended. There were six of us that went through disciplinary hearings. There was a huge free speech movement that happened on the UT campus. Five of the six people on disciplinary probation were in SDS and were on the RAG. The suspension of the student leaders and the arrest of the non-student activists set off the university freedom movement in which the students went on strike and uh, tried to shut the campus down for about three weeks of non-stop meetings in the courtyard at College House on New Isis Street where these meetings just went on and on and on and on and on. The war in Vietnam reached its peak during these years. The daily body count was part of the national news. Images of the destruction and death were unrelenting. The protests against the war increased and opposition to the war became the primary focus of the RAG. The war had to be stopped and no matter all the other things that people were organizing, some of us were doing several different things at the same time, um, but we were all absolutely committed to stopping the war as quickly as possible. Returning veterans joined the protest and Alan Pogue started working with the RAG in 1968. And so being a medic with the infantry, it was where I finally learned what was going on. You know, napalming civilians. I mean, I was a medic. I had to deal with all this stuff. Uh, bombing civilians, driving through their little rice paddies with tanks, shooting their water buffalo, stealing their rice. Both my friends were being killed and the Vietnamese were being killed. And finally what happened was my best friend got killed. It, it helped me see through everything and, and ask all of the hard questions. So when I got back to the world, as we said, I joined the Vietnam Veterans Against the War as soon as I came across them on campus. The RAG was the only publication in Austin where you could, where you could tell the truth as I saw it. Uh, uh, the, the Cambodian incursion march, which was the day of Kent State, you know, the marching, the killing shootings at Kent State happened that same day. Just as um, we got to the, uh, uh, to just past 24th Street, and we were at the RAG office, uh, there were some Panthers who were there who um, were egging us on out of the RAG office windows and the Women's Liberation Movement. I think the Women's Liberation Movement had an office next door and um, at the time. And so uh, we started charging, Bob Bauer leading the way with his upside down American flag and uh, went down towards what was then 19th Street, now MLK. So we came down and the police came out and they blocked the street. I think we were marching down Guadalupe. Uh, they blocked the street and we came up to that intersection and took off down another intersection and then down another intersection and down another one and the police are chasing us and move, trying to move their lines to block us. There was a group that went through the middle of the state capitol, one that went around each side, okay? And then on the other side, we were about to go downtown, and there were people who wanted to trash downtown because we were really pissed off. And there's a line of heavily armed policemen 
across 11th Street. They start firing tear gas grenades over our heads so that the grenades go off behind us and there are the, these clouds of tear gas coming at us. Uh, then there's this flying charge of cops from the line and they're, they're beating people up and I go in the Capitol building and get a couple of good breaths of uh, Texas air conditioned air when all of a sudden pop, and there's tear gas in the Texas state capitol. I couldn't believe it. They're firing tear gas grenades inside the capitol.